Thank you, Chris and Hillary, and thank you everyone here for being here. I really appreciate it. My name is Hernan Luis y Prado. I'm a Navy combat veteran, 15 years, with uh, tours of duty in Afghanistan and Iraq. And I love the Navy. I really do, and I did. But I left because I was tired of seeing more of my friends die of drugs and suicide in San Diego than of bombs and bullets in Baghdad. And I was going to change that. And that was tough for me because I didn't really understand how I was going to, and it was a big issue. But I wanted to share with all of you here kind of like our journey of how we created Workshops for Warriors, which is the only accredited school in the nation that trains, certifies, and places veterans, wounded warriors, and transitioning service members into advanced manufacturing careers. So, first of all, does anyone here serve in the military? If you could put your hands up, please. Good, awesome. Navy, Marine Corps, Air, Air, Air Force, Air Force, Coasties. We love you, Coasties. We know we do. Army. I will speak very slowly. And it's not funny. It's not funny. And use small words for you. Okay. So, I'm very fortunate that I am married to the most beautiful nerd I know, my wife Rachel. <laughs> and that's important because if you are an officer, right, you're, we're really used to seeing world, the whole world in a very different aspect, right? You're looking at things and very operational, how, how are you going to do this, how are you going to do that, but you're kind of lockstep, you're in this fabric. And, you know, I came back from my first combat tour after I, Iraq, and I, I was seeing notionally, right, um, that I saw people injured and I saw them out there, but it wasn't affecting me. I just saw people out there. And one day, um, I was in a mall with my wife, and this guy, John, who had been enlisted with me over in 29 Palms, if you've ever been there, a great place to get a sand, uh, suntan, if you've ever been there, it's awesome. But <laughs> So John and I had just seen each other in Iraq just a couple months beforehand. And here we are in this little mall. I think we we're in front of like FAO shorts or something completely, you know, just common, right? And my wife and I are there and this guy comes up to me and says, hey, doc. Right? When I was enlisted, I was a corpsman. So, um, hey, doc, how are you doing? I said, well, great. He goes, well, you know, great to see you. He goes, hey, could you be my best man at my wedding this Friday? You know, and I'm... So I'm thinking, and I was like, we had talked about this, and it wasn't going to be this week, and I knew it was going to be like next year that they were going to get married. So I didn't want to say anything because his fiance was right there. I said, yeah, sure, of course, of course I'll be your best man. And then I said, well, get up, man, give me a hug. And he goes, well, I can't, Doc. And I said, why? He goes, I lost my legs. I was like, what? What do you mean? And I looked down, and I noticed he was in a wheelchair. And I mean, I... I had noticed he was in a wheelchair before, but it hadn't, you know, I just thought, you know, he had injured his ankle or, you know, something like that. But it hit me. Like, he didn't have his legs anymore. And this is a guy that, like, I knew him. Like, this guy meant something to me. This is a guy that I went to captain's call for because I wrestled him to the ground once to put sunblock on his face because I was tired of carrying his weapons whenever he fell out of a, of a march, right? And so, and this guy didn't have legs anymore. And I could just see, you ever had those moments when you're looking at a movie and you like see like 10 years of history fly by? I was seeing all of these things that he, he wanted to do, all the things that were important in his life, and I saw them all evaporating. I saw them not be possible anymore. And the one thing that he had lived for, which was the Marine Corps, wasn't going to keep him around. And it hit me so deeply. And for those of you that are in the military, you know, you make fun of guys like that that are crying at the mall, but I was floored. And I kind of gathered myself and I said, of course, John, of course I'll be there. And he wheeled around and left. And in my mind's eye, I was thinking, here I am, you know, tough guy, combat veteran, catching prisoners of war, and I sank to the ground 
and grabbed onto my wife's elbow and said, we are going to sell everything that we have and we're going to create an advanced training center so that guys like John have a viable future. And my wife, to her eternal credit, said, of course. Thank you, Rachel. So, and I've been so lucky because Rachel has, you know, I've, been, I've been surrounded by a lot of people, you know. One of the key things that Rachel taught me as a survey methodologist and statistician and, you know, nerd par excellence is, <laughs> what is it? Like, figure out the program and the problem, right? And the military teaches you, right? Orient, observe, right? Detect, and then make a decision and act on it. And it was this like mingling of two worlds, right? The fuzzy, bunny, hippie world and then the military world, which made me think, you know, know what you know, know what you don't know, and know that what you know may be wrong, <laughs> and then figure out what the situation is. And the first thing is, why were veterans killing themselves? And after a lot of research, it was that they had it just lost focus and income, purpose, direction, and hope. And we don't realize that, but when you're in the military, we're in this fabric, this big tapestry, and you know who's ahead of you, you know who's behind you, you know who's your peer, and your bosses are expecting something from you, and the people that report to you, you're, you're demanding things from there, and your peers, you know, they kind of help you out, but you're in this fabric, and you're moving together in this beautiful tapestry, which is the U.S. military, e even the Army. And... <laughs> But then all of a sudden, you get plucked out. They say, hey, thank you for serving. Get out. And it, it doesn't, I know it doesn't say, they don't say that, but that's how you feel. Because you, you can't go to the Navy Exchange. You can't go to the Lodge. Your ID card doesn't work anymore. You're not in uniform. You don't wake up every morning to put a uniform on to feel like you're serving. And that loss of ego and, what was it? An identity is something that's staggeringly difficult to accept. And so the first thing was, why is this happening? And we realized that. The second one was, you know, I'd go to a hospital and one of my friends would say, hey doc, how are you doing? And so this is my story with, with Rachel, is after that time, um, and we just had a couple of people over my house, and you know, Marines are Marines, right? So it's not like they're gonna sit there and be like, you know, I feel today a little bit shy that, I don't know what it is. It's like my, I just don't know where to be. And, you know, I just don't really know how to express myself. You know, that's not these guys. They'll be like, hmm, where's the garage? All right, got a beer. All right. And then they'd go off into the garage. And then after a while, we'd be like, hey, how are you feeling? And they're like, you know, I'm all right. And then after eight or nine beers later, you know, they'd, figure, they'd say, hey, you know, I don't, I don't really know what I'm going to do later. Like, I don't know how to look at my 22-year-old wife and tell her that I don't have a job in six months, right? And so it hit me. What, what can we do to transition people that are super competent, committed, dedicated, and give them something that gives you a lifelong career, that gives you a dignified life, a dignified career with a potential for career accession? And it, you know, it hit me. Um, as my old boss, Admiral Arthur, so Admiral Don Arthur, if you're out there, thank you very much. I appreciate your guidance on this. But he would say, you can't have all these vets in your place. You can't be a VFW with power tools. <laughs> and, I say, and at the time, I was like, well, you're right, you're right. But and then it made me really focus what I wanted to do in a very clear fashion. And instead of saying, you know, air quotes, I'm going to help vets or I'm going to support vets, that didn't mean anything to me, partly because my beautiful wife is a statistician. And she's like, okay, so... There's a little box that says yes, and another box that says no. So what do you want to say about what you do for veterans? Helping is not one of them. How do you define help? What are the metrics in there? And we decided we're going to create a metric-driven, data-driven organization that knows what success looks like and shoots for that every day, relentlessly and intelligently. And we created workshops for warriors. We train veterans wounded warriors and transitioning service members into advanced manufacturing careers in computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, machining, 
welding, fabrication, and machinery repair. We're the SEAL team of manufacturing, if you will. And the funny thing is it's, it's a disruptive technology and disruptive school because what we're doing is we're replacing 30 to 50 different union jobs or unionized jobs, if you will, and making one guy or gal that can go from art to part in four months with credentials that are internationally recognized, portable, and stackable. And that gives them an opportunity to enter a job at $18 an hour and then build from there for life with a passport to financial freedom that no one can take away from them. That's what we're doing in a very clear, measurable way. The students come through our school and they're not focused, they don't have to worry about, are we gonna survive, are we gonna do this? They know that if they toe the line, if they come together, they come inside and we all march forward together, that they're going to graduate, get nationally recognized credentials and get a job. That's on the local level. But most importantly, what we're thinking about is right now we have this tide of over one million service members leaving the service in the next five years. America has a need for 2.4 million jobs. 2.4 million jobs in America are going unfilled due to lack of skilled labor right now. So if you think about that, this for me was like a perfect storm where we have one million veterans transitioning out. We need 2.4 million advanced manufacturers. And the median age of America's advanced manufacturing employee is 62 years old. 62. So in 15 years, who's going to build our ships, our aircraft, our bridges, that guy's iPad, right? Who's going to do it? Most importantly, if we go to war in five years, and ceilings are cut, how are we gonna rebuild our nation? This is how. We're creating an America's advanced manufacturing army. I hate using that term, but <laughs> one vet at a time. And these people here are gonna go out and train other people to become advanced manufacturing warfighters. And they're gonna train others. And we're gonna take back America's role as the world's manufacturing superpower and we're going to regain our role as the world's economic superpower in an environmentally friendly fashion. Hi. Thank you. My vision is that 100 years from today, people will look back and they'll see San Diego and workshops for warriors and hopefully people that they trained. And they're going to see that Workshops for Warriors was the birthing or the birthplace of America's green manufacturing renaissance. And it started right here. But most importantly, it started because I had an idea and I felt like I was out in the desert with a 200 pound bag and I was lugging it along. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my wife Rachel showed up. She grabbed the other handle. She lifted it up, looked at me, and we started moving forward. And then Amanda Brooks, now Barber, who's on our board of directors, grabbed the other handle. And Ethan Weinstein grabbed another handle. And they didn't question me. They didn't poo-poo me. They moved forward with me. And we kept accelerating. And since then, we've had an incredible array of intelligent, competent, passionate people that have shared their time and energy with me and have been patient with me when I failed, which has been many times. <laughs> and now, every day, I look left, I look to my right, and I look behind me, and I can see a multitude of people that have joined us, and I can feel the earth trembling with the sound of us marching in unison towards a more constructive and better America and world. Thank you very much.